In this full course, you are going to learn about one of the youngest programming languages that is becoming more and more popular in the cloud engineering world, which is Go or also commonly known as Golang. You will learn everything you need to get started with Go and start using it in your projects. We're going to write a very simple CLI application to learn the basics of Go. So instead of learning the concepts and syntax of Go with isolated examples, you will learn them while building an actual application throughout the tutorial. So first, let's see a detailed overview of what you will learn. Before diving right into the syntax, you will first understand why Go was even developed, its use cases and differences to other programming languages. As a next step, we will set up our local development environment and see how the basic structure of a Go file looks like. Then as we start writing our simple ticket booking application, you will learn the core concepts and syntax like the most common data types such as strings, integers, booleans, as well as arrays, slices, maps and structs. You will also learn about variables and constants, about formatted output, getting and validating user input, a concept of pointers in Go, as well as variable scopes. Then you will see how to control the application flow with loops, if else and switch statements, as well as how to encapsulate logic in functions and generally how to organize your code in Go packages. Finally, we will make use of Go routines to parallelize some of the execution to make our application faster with concurrency. So we're going to learn a lot of things in this course, and I hope you are excited to get started. Also, I want to mention that all the demo code from this course is available in a Git repository, which we will link in the video description, so you can follow along easily. We have put a lot of effort in creating this course. So if by the end of this course, you think it was valuable for you, let me know by leaving a like and subscribe for more content like this. And also be sure to check out techworldwithnana.com for online courses and a complete DevOps educational program if you want to further educate yourself and bring your career to the next level. Now for viewers, absolutely new to programming in general, you can also check out my Python course on YouTube, which is even more targeted to complete beginners in programming. And with that, let's get started. Go was created by Google in 2007 and open sourced in 2009. So it's a pretty young language. Now, whenever you hear about a new programming language, the first question you probably have is, why do we need yet another programming language? What is the purpose of it? Or how is it better or different from other already existing languages? So before diving into the syntax, let's see what was the motivation behind creating the Go language. Well, the infrastructure where the applications were deployed changed a lot in the last few years. Multi-core processors became common and also using cloud infrastructure with hundreds or thousands of servers with multiple processors to deploy applications became pretty universal. So infrastructure became much more scalable, dynamic and had more capacity. However, most languages couldn't help in writing applications that would take advantage of these infrastructure improvements. So basically you had applications that would just execute one task at a time in order. But with infrastructure improvements, it was possible to now write applications that would execute tasks in parallel, do multiple things at once, this way making the application faster and more user friendly. A simple example is if you are using Google Drive, you may be uploading or downloading files and folders, but you can keep navigating back and forth in the UI. So downloading, uploading and navigating the UI all happen in parallel. Or consider YouTube. You can be listening to this video, then scroll down to the comments, write a comment yourself, like the video, etc. So the application allows you to do multiple things at once without affecting any other task. And this is a concept of multi-threading. So each thread is basically processing one task and you can have many of them running in parallel. And this makes applications fast, but may also cause some issues. 
For example, on Google Docs, many users can work on the same document at the same time. So when you have two users changing and adding stuff at the same time to the same document, this should work smoothly without one user overriding all the changes that another user is making. Another example where such issues may happen when things are processed in parallel is a booking system for buying tickets or booking a hotel, etc. Let's say again, two users are trying to book the last remaining ticket at the same time. Of course, this should work in a way that no double booking happens. And this concept is called concurrency and needs to be handled by developers in code. So they must write code that prevents any conflicts between the tasks when multiple tasks are running in parallel and updating the same data. And many languages do have features for implementing such applications. However, the code can get pretty complex and handling and preventing the concurrency issues can be pretty hard. And with complexity, of course, there is always a higher risk of human errors. And that's where the main purpose and difference of Go comes into the picture. So Go was designed exactly for that purpose, to make writing multi-threaded concurrent applications that take advantage of the new performant infrastructure much easier. And we will learn about this in more detail at the end of the course when we use Go routines. So logically enough, the main use case of Go or what it's best used for is writing applications that need to be very performant and will run on the modern scaled and distributed infrastructure with hundreds and thousands of servers, typically on a cloud platform. For developing Go, they wanted to take the simplicity of syntax of a more high level language like Python and the speed and efficiency of a lower level language like C++. So you will see the combination of these things in Go. And I have to note that Go is used on the server side or the backend side of the applications. And these types of applications can range from microservices and web applications to database services and so on. In fact, many cloud technologies or technologies that run on modern cloud environments are actually written in Go like Docker, HashiCorp Vault, Kubernetes, CockroachDB, and so on. Now, on top of this main purpose of Go, Go actually has a lot of other advantages. One of them that I already mentioned is it has a very simple syntax, which makes your code very maintainable, easy to read and extend. Another advantage is that Go applications can be built very fast. They are also very fast in startup and also when they're running. Plus Go is very resource efficient, which means it uses few resources or it requires fewer resources like CPU and RAM to run. Go is also a compiled language and it compiles actually very quickly into a single binary and you can deploy it and run it on different platforms in a consistent way. So no matter which operating system or which environment you're using, you can take that same binary and basically use it across different platforms. So considering all these benefits of simplicity and speed and so on, Go is becoming more and more popular for writing simple automation applications and command line interface applications for DevOps and SRE tasks as well. So now that we know why Go was created and what differentiates it from other languages, let's jump right into learning the core concepts and syntax of Go. Now to start writing a Go project, we're going to need two software programs. First of all, we're going to need Go compiler. And second, we're going to need an IDE or integrated development environment where we're going to write code for Go and also execute it. As an IDE, we're going to use Visual Studio Code, which is super easy to download and install. So if you don't have it yet on your computer, just type in install Visual Studio Code in Google and basically on their official page, you have the download options for all operating systems. So go ahead, download and install it. So that's the first part. I already have Visual Studio Code locally, so I'm gonna skip this part. And second, we're gonna need to install Go compiler. Right now, I don't have Go locally. That's why when I type Go, 
it tells me command not found. So we're going to install go, which is also super easy. Again, type install go. And on their official page, you have download and install guide. And again, for different operating systems, I'm working on Mac. So I'm going to download the go package for Mac. Awesome. Once that's downloaded, just click on the package. And it will show you an installer, which basically lets you install go step by step, setting up everything necessary in the background. So we're going to do continue install for all users. We're going to leave all the defaults, install, authorize. And as you see, installation was successful. So, so if I close this window, we can remove the installer and go back to the terminal and type go. As you see, we have go installed. That's why you see a bunch of go commands that you can start using now. Great. So we have everything prepared. Let's create a folder in which we're going to write our Go project. And I'm going to call it booking app. And using Visual Studio Code, we're going to write Go program in that folder. So I'm going to open Visual Studio Code. And I'm in the booking app folder. You can also simply just open Visual Studio Code and then basically choose a folder that you want to work in and you have the same result. And I'm going to make it a little bigger for convenience. And there is one more thing that we need to do to prepare our setup. And that is installing a Go extension inside the Visual Studio Code. The extension will basically help us in writing the Go code. It will give us a nice syntax highlighting, IntelliSense to basically easily navigate our code, help with troubleshooting and so on. So extensions for different languages make it much easier to write code in that language. So let's go ahead and do that to complete our setup. And on the left side right here, you have the extensions tab. So if I click inside and then search Go, it will give us all the available extensions for Visual Studio Code. And the first one with the most downloads is the official one from Go team at Google. And you also have a description of what that extension gives you. And that's the extension we're going to use. So click on install. And that's it. Now we're all set up to start writing our first Go application in Visual Studio Code. And for that, obviously, we need to create a file. And this is going to be the main.go file with .go extension. You will see a bunch of pop-ups here to install things for the Go extension. So go ahead and click on Install All. And that will install and set up the rest of the stuff. And main.go is basically a standard name for the main file where the Go application code is written. And to see that in the File Explorer, we have this booking app folder and inside we have this main.go file. Now, how do we start writing code in Go? Like printing a simple hello world message to the console. Let's do print quotes hello world. And we already see the first benefit of a Go extension because it tells us that this code doesn't work. And as you see, the error says that Go can't find a file called go.mod. So the first thing we need to fix is to make our Go application into a project. And for that, we need to basically initialize it. That's the error that we get here. And to do that, we're going to open a terminal in Visual Studio Code, a new terminal window, and this will give us terminal in booking app folder, which we're in, which is very convenient. And here I'm going to run a go command called go mod or module in it. And basically name of the project, we called it booking app. So let's use that name. So this is going to basically initiate our go application into a module or a project. And we're calling it booking app. So let's execute and save. 
So what this command actually did in the background is it generated this go.mod file, which simply describes the project with the name of the project and the version of Go that is used here. So the first issue is now fixed. Now we have another error that says expected package. So in Go, everything is organized into packages and we're going to be using Go packages throughout our application. And when we create our own application, we also have to include it in a package. And doing that is actually very simple. As the first line of our Go application, we define keyword package and then name of the package which our application will be part of. And the standard name for the main application is package main. So now we have an initialized Go application, which is in a package called main. Moving on to the next error, we now see again a different message that says that a declaration is expected. Now I have to note here that you may actually have a different sequence of errors. So you might see a different message here, but I'm going to show it to you with my examples. So in this case, we have a missing declaration and that is basically Go's way of saying, I don't know where to start executing this application. So give me an entry point and we have to declare the entry point of our application because when we run Go applications, we need the main starting point for the execution. So Go needs to know where does it start executing the code on which line? Because if you have multiple files in the Go project, you need to give Go compiler a starting point, the first line of code where the execution starts. And the entry point is a main function that Go will look for whenever you execute your Go application. And we create a main function using func keyword, name of the function. Again, it has to be called main. And we have to put our logic, whatever we are executing within that main function. So now Go will know where to start executing our application. And for one Go application, you're going to have one main because you can only have one entry point to your application. So now I have a slightly changed syntax highlighting for our print function. And if we hover over it, we see another error message that says undeclared name. Now we've come to the point where our application belongs to a package. We have the entry point. So Go knows where to start the execution. And it sees that print is the first code that it's going to execute. But the problem here is that it doesn't know where print is coming from. That's why we see undeclared name. And print is a function that comes from a Go package, a built-in package called FMT or format. And we have to explicitly import any packages from which we're using the functionality. So we're going to do import quotes FMT. That's the name of the Go package. And to use a print function or any function from the package, we're going to do FMT dot print. And immediately, as you see, the error is gone. And as I mentioned, similar to many other programming languages, everything is organized into packages. So the Go program that we installed actually already has some built in packages with a bunch of functionality that we can use. And one of them is this package that we just imported. And as I said, the packages have functions that we can use. So whenever we want to use a built in Go function, to print a text, to get user input, to validate something, etc. We need to explicitly import it from one of the packages. So think of the packages as containers of various functionalities that Go gives you readily available for you to use when writing your applications. Now, how do you know which functions are in which packages? Or let's say if you need to get a user input, how do you know in which package you have that functionality available? Well, you actually have to look up the documentation to see that, or basically just simply Google to find the right package. And of course, with time when using Go and its packages, you're going to know the most commonly used packages and all their functionalities. And a cool thing we have here is you see this underline under the FMT package. And if I hover 
Over it, you see a link that actually takes you to the official documentation of the FMT package. So here you can actually see what functions you have available in that package and so on. So with this, we have our first fully functioning Go application that we can now execute. So let's clean up our terminal and executing a Go application is very easy. We have a Go command for it called Go run and name of the file that we are executing, which is main.go. So Go run will basically execute this file. It will look for the main function and execute the contents or lines within that function one by one. We just have one line, so that's getting executed and we're seeing hello world in the output. We can do a final optimization here to add a new line at the end of this print statement. And to do that, we're simply going to use a different function from format package called println. So this will print whatever we pass here with a new line. And let's execute that again. And there you go. Now that we have the minimum program structure and know how to run Go programs, let's start writing our booking application logic. The very first thing we need to do in our booking application is to greet our users when they visit the application. So let's write some welcome message and information about the conference for which they are booking the tickets. So instead of hello world, we're going to write welcome message like welcome to our conference booking application. And we can write another message like get your tickets here to attend. And again, if we execute this, we're going to see our welcome message. Pretty easy. Now, let's say our conference has a name and we're using this name in many places in our application. In the welcome message, in the thank you message, when the user books the ticket, on the ticket itself, etc. And whenever we have a value like conference name that is used in many places throughout the application, it's the most common usage for variables. Every programming language has a concept of variables where instead of repeating this value everywhere, you store it once in a variable, assign it a name, and now you can reference that value using its variable name wherever you need it in your code. Now, if the value changes, you don't have to find and update it in multiple places throughout the application code, but you can simply change it in one place where you assigned it to a variable and that's it. So how do we create and use variables in Go? Well, we have the value, like the name of the conference, let's call it Go Conference, and we store that value in a variable, and we can give that variable whatever name we want, like this. Let's call it a name. And finally, we tell Go that we're creating a variable using a var keyword. So this basically lets us store the value Go Conference, the conference name, in a variable called name. So now we can use that value by referencing the variable name wherever we need it. Now with variables, it's a good practice to create variable names that properly describe what the value is. In our case, name may be too generic. So to make it more specific and clear, we can call it a conference name. And note the camel case syntax here, which is a pretty common variable naming convention in different programming languages, including Go. And if I save those changes, you see that we get a red line under our variable definition, and that is something specific to Go language. So in Go, unlike many other programming languages, when we define a variable, or when we create a variable with a certain value and we don't use it in the code, we get this error that actually says conference name declared but not used. So to fix this error, we actually have to use that variable. And note that same error applies when you import a package 
but you don't use that package in your code. You get the same error that package gets imported but not used, which is a very good reminder to clean up your code. So to fix this issue, we're simply gonna print out that variable value using print line function. And again, when I save this change, the error disappears. So let's clean up the terminal output and run our Go application again. And there you go, you see Go conference printed out. Now let's actually use that conference name in our welcome message. Instead of generic our conference, we're gonna reference whatever we define as a conference name. For that, first of all, let's delete the print statement. And again, as a common practice, we're gonna define the variable at the beginning of the function. And we can use the variable within the print message by dividing the actual text that we have here and the variable name with commas inside the print ln function. So this will be substituted by conference name and then the actual text and the variable name will be separated by commas. And let's save this. And if I execute our Go application again, we will see welcome to Go conference booking application. So it took the value from here. Also note that the space automatically gets added before and after the variable value. Now, what we also need in our application is the tickets for our conference. And let's say we have total of 50 conference tickets available for users to book. And for that, we will also create a reference called conference tickets to store that value once, and then we can reference it as many times as we want. So let's call it conference tickets. And the value will be 50. We have 50 tickets available. Now, this value actually does not change throughout the application, right? We have 50 conference tickets and it will always stay 50 while our application is running. And for such values that do not change or stay constant, instead of variables, we have constants. Now, as you might think, the conference name could also be a constant because it also doesn't change throughout the program. But for this example, we will leave it as a variable. So instead of var keyword, here we're gonna use const, and that will give us the same type of reference as with variables, but this time we cannot change the value of this constant. But we can use it and reference it in our application exactly the same way as our variables. So the const keyword tells Go that this value is not allowed to change. And if we actually try that, and somewhere in the application code, change it to some other value, and then try to use that like this. We get a warning here right away that says, cannot assign to conference tickets because it's declared as a constant. But if we change it to var and save, you see that the warning disappears. So let's change it back to const and clean those lines up. Now, when users start booking the tickets, obviously we need to keep track of the ticket count. So when 50 users book their tickets, we inform the rest that the conference is completely sold out. So every time someone books a ticket, we need to basically reduce the number of available tickets that users can book. And for tracking that amount, we're gonna create another variable for remaining tickets. And we're gonna call it remaining tickets, which again is a variable because as users book their tickets, this value will get less and less. And it starts at 50 because that's how many tickets we have in total. And again, we have this warning because we're not using it. So let's actually use that in our welcome message to inform the users about how many tickets are available for the conference and how many of them are still remaining. So between these two lines, I'm gonna add another print statement 
And here we're going to say we have total of this many tickets. And this many are still available. And if I save this, the warning will go away because we are using both of these values in our code. So again, separating the actual text from the variable reference using commas. Now let's run our updated application. And in the message, we have the name of the conference. And here it says we have a total of 50 tickets and 50 are still available. Now, whenever we're printing our text mixed with variables, we can use a function called printf from the format package. This function is specifically used for printing format data. So it tells Go how to format the values of the variables. And generally, it makes writing this kind of outputs easier. So with printf, this line, for example, will look like this. So instead of print ln, we're going to use printf, another function from the format package. And instead of the conference name reference, we're going to use what's called a placeholder and annotate that using percentage sign and v. And you see the syntax highlighting here that shows that it's a special character for placeholder. But of course, we still need to reference whatever variable we want to substitute here, right? And we do that right here with a comma and then conference name. And if I save this and run, we have the same output. One thing that is different here is the new line is missing because we were using println that automatically added a new line. In this case, we're going to add it explicitly using backslash n. So that's a character for new line. And if I save this and run, we have exactly the same output as before. Now let's do the same for the second print statement. First, change it to printf. Take this reference here and substitute it with percentage v. Do the same for the second variable reference. And again, we need to replace. So basically, we need to tell Go which variable values should be used to replace those placeholders. And of course, they should be in a correct order when we have multiple such placeholders. So the first one is conference tickets. The second one is remaining tickets. And again, the new line backslash n. Save it. And there you go. Now, as I mentioned, printf or print format function allows you to tell Go how to format the variables that you're referencing here. The percentage V is the default format, but you have other specific formats also available if you want the values to be displayed differently. And you can see this whole list in the Go documentation under the FMT package link. So the percentage V is the one we used, but you have a lot of other options as well for numbers and text values and so on. Now, sometimes when we create a variable, we don't immediately know its value. For example, when we're getting user input, like a user entering their name and date of birth, etc., in the application, we don't know that value before because we don't know what the user is going to enter. So we create a variable and later we assign it the value, which is possible to do in Go, just like in other programming languages. So let's see the syntax for that. So here, let's say we define a variable called username, and we don't know what the value of that variable is going to be. And on the next line, we ask the user for their name. And this is a syntax for comment. So whatever starts with double forward slash signs is basically interpreted as a comment. So it's not executed as code. 
So let's say we have some imaginary code here that asks for user input and they and that user name that we get is let's say Tom. And finally we can actually use that value. So we have defined a variable here and then we are assigning a value for that variable later on a separate line. However, when I save this code, you see that we get another warning here that says unexpected new line expecting type. So what's the problem here? And why is it expecting a type? Well, in Go, all values have data types. And generally, in any programming language, you have multiple data types for different use cases. And Go isn't an exception. The difference between these languages is, however, which data types exactly they support. So each language has its own set of data types. Two most basic and common data types are strings and integers. For textual data, like the welcome message, the name of the conference, so anything between the quotes, basically, is a string data type. For numeric data, like ticket count, age, and so on, we have integer data type. And again, you see the syntax highlighting for the integers and strings are different because Go basically knows this is a string, this is an integer. So these are the two most basic ones, but we're going to learn a few other data types as we go along. Here, however, it's important to understand that each data type can be used differently and behaves differently. For example, you can do calculations with integers, but you can't do calculations with strings. You can chain or get a subset of a string, but you can't do that with integers. So the main purpose of having types for values in code is to avoid accidentally using an integer as a string or vice versa and use one data type instead of the other, which may break your application. So when we create variables in Go, it needs a type. Now you may be thinking when we created these two variables right here, these two variables and a constant, we didn't specify a type. So why didn't we get the same syntax error here? Well, when we create a variable or constant and assign a value to it immediately on the same line, Go can imply the data type based on the value. So Go knows that this is a variable type for string and this is a constant and variable types for integers because of the values. But when we do not assign a value immediately, Go doesn't know what type of value you are going to store here. So it asks you to explicitly define a type to make your code basically more robust and prevent you or other developers from accidentally assigning a wrong data type value to that variable later in the code. So in this case, we need to define a type explicitly. How do we define a type? Super easy. At the end, we just say this is a variable of string type. And if I save this, the error disappears. And again, you see the syntax highlighting for the type. And the same way we can define a variable for integer type. Let's say user tickets, which is a number of tickets user wants to buy. And this is going to be an integer type. And somewhere here, we're going to ask user for the input. And let's say they enter two and in the print statement with print f we're going to say user whatever their username booked this many tickets with a new line and reference the respective variables and again let's run this and here we have our output now you probably already noticed something really cool about Go, especially if you have worked with other programming languages before. And that is that while we're writing this code, if we make some mistakes, if we have errors in our code, for example, defining a variable and not using it or forgetting to specify a type, etc., Go basically detects those errors before we even run the application. 
So by the time we're ready to execute the application, we have fixed a bunch of errors that go identified and highlighted for us. In many programming languages, that's not the case. Usually you discover these kind of errors when you run the application, not while you're coding. And that is a big advantage of Go. Now going back to the types, I mentioned that Go actually implies the types of these three values automatically. And if we wanted, we could actually print out the types of variables using the printf function. So with fmt printf, let's print out the types of these two variables and a constant. So conference tickets is whatever type it has, then remaining tickets is whatever type this one has, and then conference name is percentage t. Percentage t is a placeholder for the type of the variable that we're referencing here, not the value like percentage v, but the type. So let's pass in those references and save. And if we run our application, we should see the output here, conference tickets is int or integer, remaining tickets is int, conference name is string. So this lets you print type of any variable. Now, if we wanted, we could actually define the types explicitly here, even though it's not required. So we could do conference name as a string, an int and int. However, specifying a type explicitly when Go can detect it makes sense when we want to specify a different type than what Go would detect. For example, in Go specifically, again, we have multiple times for numeric values. So in addition to int or integer type, which represents whole numbers, we have int 8, int 16, int 32, and int 64 which corresponds to the length of the integer. So basically how big or how large the number is. And in addition to that, we also have uint or unsigned integer, which represents whole numbers like integer, but only positive ones. So zero and plus. And here's a chart of all the different numeric data types in Go. And obviously each one has its own purpose. So the question is when to use which one and why do we have so many different integer data types, for example? Well, this allows you to define data types in a way that the values will automatically be validated. So if you're using uint and assign a negative value to it, you will get an error. Like in our case, the number of remaining tickets should never be negative, but with int type, it can be. So somewhere in the code, we can actually set it to a negative number like this. But if we specify a type uint explicitly instead and save it, you see that it will not accept the negative value. So setting a type may actually protect our variable from getting a value that it's not supposed to get. And obviously you as a developer are not gonna assign your variables a wrong value, but if you're doing some calculations on your variables or some processing, the result of that calculation may be a wrong value. We also have float number type, which are for numbers with fractional parts, so not whole numbers. This could be statistical data, like a conference attendance compared to last year, for example. This could also be monetary values, like prices of products in an online shop or transactions in an online banking application, and so on. So basically, when a number needs a higher precision, float number type needs to be used. But as I said, there are other data types in Go besides textual and numeric types, which we will learn as well. Now, there is one more thing in terms of variable definition in Go, and that is again specific to Go, is that we have an alternative syntax for creating a variable and assigning it a value directly. This is like a syntactic sugar of Go language. 
So instead of this syntax for creating a variable, we can get rid of the var keyword as well as the type and right here before the equal sign, just add a colon. And this will do the same as before, create a variable and assign it a value. Now note here that with this alternative syntax, you cannot declare constants. So we cannot do this with constants. It only applies to variables. And it also doesn't work if you want to explicitly define a type for your variable, like here, for example. Now let's clean up our code and let's go back to our ticket booking logic. So this is a booking application. So we want to allow users to book their tickets. And for that, we want to ask users for their personal information first, like first name, last name, etc. And all these values will be then saved into variables like this. So we need some logic here that allows the application to ask for user input. In order to read user input, we use another function from the same format package called scan. So basically the format package gives us different functions to print out like this formatted output or read formatted input. So it's used for input output processing functionality. So let's scan the user input for their first name, because instead of assigning the value directly as we did here, we want to get that value from the user and then assign it to the username variable. Now print function like printf or println takes a message as a parameter like this one, a formatted message and prints it. Scan also takes a parameter, which is the input it needs to scan. And the parameter for scan function is the user input. But we don't know what the user will enter as their name. So we need a way to save the user input as a variable and then reference that value using that variable name instead of directly assigning it here. And let's save it. So this is supposed to scan user input and whatever user enters basically assign that value to username variable as a value. Now, if we run this application, let's run it. You see that it runs, it executes all those lines and it just exits. It doesn't wait for any user input. So we were not able to enter anything. And the value of the user here or username variable is also empty. So there is one thing that we need to fix here. So before the username variable, we need to add what's called a pointer like this. So what is a pointer simply explained? I said that we save a value in a variable in order to use it later. So when we create a variable, where does that value actually get stored? Well, values are saved in memory on your computer. So that 50 or go conference values are actually stored in memory. But whenever we reference that value using the variable name we defined, Go compiler must go and find that value in memory. So it needs to know where in memory exactly it is stored. Or in other words, it needs to know the memory address of that value. And a pointer is a variable that points to the memory address of another variable that references the actual value 50, for example. And pointers in Golang are also called special variables. So to see that in the code, let's actually comment this out. And if we print out any variable like remaining tickets, for example, with value 50, this will give us the actual value 50. But if we print out the pointer, this will actually print out the memory location of the remaining tickets variable. And let's actually see that. Right here, we have value 50. And the next line is a hash, which is a memory address for the remaining tickets variable. So that's basically a pointer. And it's also important to mention that pointers is a concept used in the C programming language. But many popular programming languages like Java or JavaScript, for example, do not have pointers, at least not exposed to you as a developer. So you will not see the concept of pointers in many other languages. 
So again, going back to our scan function, instead of passing the value of the username variable, which is empty, we're passing the memory address of that variable so that scan function will read whatever the user enters and assign that value to that username variable in memory. So if I execute the application now, you see that it doesn't just exit, it actually stops at this line after get your tickets here to attend. And it's now waiting for me as a user to input some data. And as a username, I can input my own name. And if I enter, it goes to the next line and it prints out whatever is in the username booked to tickets. So now we have that value, whatever user entered, available in our code through this username variable. Now to make this a little bit user friendlier, we can also ask the user explicitly what we are asking for. So we can say, enter your first name like this. And let's run again. And there you go. So now we are actually asking the user explicitly what we want and then printing the result out. So that's one value. Now let's read other user data like last name, email and number of tickets user wants to book. And let's first call this first name and update it everywhere like this. Let's create last name, which is also a string and email, which is also a string and user tickets, which we already have, which is an int. And now one by one, let's actually scan all those values. I'm going to copy these two lines and we're going to say, enter your last name. And we're going to save that value that user enters in a last name variable. Again, let's copy and let's say, enter your email address. And the value will be stored in email variable. And finally, instead of assigning user tickets directly, we're going to ask the user how many tickets they want. Enter number of tickets. And again, this will be stored in user tickets variable. And at the end, let's actually print out some kind of a thank you message to the user with some additional information. So let's write thank you, first name, last name of the user for booking so many tickets. You will receive a confirmation email at whatever email address they gave us. And don't forget the new line at the end. And now let's actually substitute those placeholders with the actual variable references. So we have first name, last name. Then here we have the third one, user tickets. And finally, the email address they gave us. Awesome. So let's clean this up and run our program. Enter your first name, Nana. Enter your last name, my last name, email address, something like this. And finally, number of tickets, let's say three tickets. And if I enter, this is the last scan. So now it's going to execute the print statement that says, thank you, Nana Janashia, for booking three tickets. You will receive a confirmation email at this email address. Now we're getting user input, but no tickets are being booked. The remaining tickets doesn't get reduced. It always stays 50. So let's write some simple logic to book the ticket, which in our case will be just reducing the number of remaining tickets. So after getting user info, we will simply add remaining tickets minus user tickets. So this will give us some value, 50 minus how many tickets user booked. And then we have to save it back into the remaining tickets variable 
to update it, right? Because we have to update the value of this variable by assigning it back. Now, when I save it, we see an issue, and that is type mismatch of uint and int, because we're doing a calculation on two numbers which have different types. One of them is u integer, and another one, user tickets, is an integer. So as you see in Go, when you do calculations between numbers, they have to have the same type. One way to handle this issue in many languages is to convert one of them to the other type using various built-in functions that you have available in the language. A simple solution for us is to make the user tickets also uint type because users can only book positive number of tickets, right? They can't book minus one or minus two number of tickets. So let's make it uint as well. And now the error is gone. So that's our super simple booking logic. And after the thank you message, we're also going to print information about how many tickets are now remaining. So let's say this many tickets remaining for this conference. Remaining tickets and conference name. So with these changes, let's now run our Go application. And again, enter the user values. And let's say we're buying 15 tickets and enter. And as you see, the remaining tickets are now 35. 50 minus 15 that we entered. Before moving on, I want to give a shout out to Keston who made this video possible. Keston's K10 is the data management platform for Kubernetes. K10 basically takes off most of the load of doing backup and restore in Kubernetes from the cluster administrators. It has a very simple UI, so it's super easy to work with and has an intelligent logic which does all the heavy lifting for you. And with my link, you can download K10 for free and get 10 nodes free forever to do your Kubernetes backups. So make sure to check out the link in the video description. And now let's continue. Now we're saving user data in variables and are booking the ticket for them. But when multiple users book the tickets, we need to save all this user data in some kind of a list, right? To keep track of who is attending the event and who booked the tickets. And for that, we have data types called arrays and slices. Arrays and slices are commonly used data types in Go applications. So let's create an array for all the bookings. So right here, I'm going to create a variable called bookings, and this is going to be an array. When we define an array, the first thing we need is the size, because arrays in Go have fixed size. And for that, we use square brackets. And within those square brackets, we define the length or size of an array. And let's say we expect maximum 50 bookings. So we're going to say 50. So the size of an array is basically how many elements can this array hold? So as I said, array is like a list of bookings or list of elements. And with the size 50, we're saying this can have 50 elements in that list. The next thing we need to define is the type of the elements this array will contain, the data type. So what kind of values are we going to store in that? Is it going to be a list of integers, a list of strings, etc.? In our case, let's say we want to store a list of names of the users who book the tickets. A name is a string. So our array is going to be an array of strings. So that's the data type. And finally, we need the actual value, right? So this is the same syntax as this one right here, where we are assigning a value directly to the variable. So we need to actually assign a value of an array. And we can have an empty array like this, or we can already put some elements in the array. And let's say these are some of the names inside. 
And this gives us a bookings array with size 50 with three elements already in that array. Now there are two things I want to mention here. First of all, because we have to define the type of the elements for the array, we can't mix any other type here. So we cannot have names and then an integer, for example, right? This will not work. And again, this is specific to Go. You can actually mix the types in some other programming languages. The second thing I want to mention is that even though we are starting with three elements here, we can actually update our array and add new elements up to 50, as well as remove the elements. So again, this is a variable, so we can add new elements to the list and remove that during the application execution. And usually, when you create an array, you actually start with an empty list like this, because you don't know the values at this point. And as the program executes, you basically add new values one by one. So that's going to be our starting point. And because we are creating an empty array, an alternative syntax for this will actually be to define the array variable like this without assigning a value and going with the default empty array. But as you learned in this case, we have to define the type for the array because Go doesn't know the type. And again, you see here, it's expecting type. So what is an array type in Go? Well, it's actually a combination of the size that we defined, which is 50, and the type of the elements it's going to contain, like this. So this is actually an array type. And we're getting this error because we're declaring a variable but not using it. So let's actually use it. And let's start by adding new elements to that array. How can we do that? Pretty simple, actually. We have a syntax with indexes. So bookings array with index, which is the position in which we're adding a new value, like this. So again, our array has 50 empty positions where we can add values. And we're saying the position 0, which is the first position, let's assign this value. And we can say position, let's say 10, let's assign a different value. But of course, normally you would go one by one, you would add the next value in the list like this. Now, in our case, again, we want to add a name of the user that booked the ticket. We want to save the first name and the last name of the user. So instead of assigning a value directly, we're going to say first name and add some space in between and the last name. So this will give us first name, last name with space separated. However, as you see here, we get an error that first name and last name are not defined because we're using these variables before they are declared here. Again, in a language like JavaScript, for example, the order doesn't matter. So this would work in JavaScript, but in Go, you have to use the variable after it has been defined in the code. So we're going to take this assignment and basically move it down here under the logic for updating the remaining tickets. And if I save this, the error is gone. So to wrap this up, we're creating an array variable at the beginning, which is defined as an array of strings with 50 elements maximum. And right here, after user has entered their first name, last name, and booked the ticket, we are adding that user's full name to the bookings variable. And to also see what's inside the bookings, let's actually print out the contents of the array and also some information about the array to see how it actually looks like. So let's do fmt print f. And first, let's print out the whole array. placeholder b and new line and this is going to be whole bookings array then let's print the first value which is bookings at index 0 
and we need to use capital P here like this. Then let's also print the type of the array like this. And finally, let's print the size or length of the array. And to get the size of an array, we have a built-in function called length with len that takes the array as an input, so to say, and gives us the size of the array. And here we need percentage and capital T. And now let's actually run our application and see how arrays work. Book five tickets. And here you see all the array information. So first of all, we have the whole array that has one element, which is first name, last name of my user. And you see that it has square brackets at the beginning and here at the end. So basically, this represents the space for all the other elements in the array because we have a fixed size of 50 elements and that's why you have a space here. Then we have just the first value, which is this one right here without the brackets. The array type is what we actually defined here as a type. And then we have array length, which is 50. Now, what happens if we try to add value to this array at an index 52, for example? So basically, index outside the range of the array size. And let's try to do that. So instead of zero index, we're going to do 52. Again, without running the application, Go actually detected that your index is out of range or out of bounds and you need to fix that. Again, if you have some calculated number here that you don't know refers to a wrong index, Go will help you basically detect that error immediately before even running the application. Now we have one issue with our array because what if you don't know the size of the array when you're creating it? Let's say we have an array for users who sign up for our newsletter. We don't know how many users are going to sign up, right? This could be anything between zero and indefinite. So how can we fixate the size here? Could be same in our case, because maybe not all 50 tickets get booked, or maybe one user basically books all 50 tickets. So we have just one booking and an array of size 50 with just one value inside. So how can we define a list that is more dynamic in size for such use cases. So basically, at least where we don't have to specify a size at the beginning, but it automatically expands as new elements get added to it. Well, exactly for that use case, instead of array, we have what's called a slice. Slice is basically an abstraction of an array. So it uses the array type under the hood, but has a dynamic size. And working with slices is also more efficient than with arrays. So generally, using slices is actually a better option than using arrays. In our application, we will also use slice instead of an array. And to define a slice, we basically create an array without a size definition, like this. Now, in an array, we added new elements using this index which is not very convenient because for each new user, we have to know exactly what is the next index that has a free spot or free place for the next value. In slices, however, we don't need to use the index. Instead, we can just say, add the next element to the slice. So the syntax for that is append, again, a built-in function from Go, just like this length function. And this append takes bookings, which is our slice. And then whatever value we want to add to this slice is a next element, whatever index that may be. And then we have to assign this back to our slice. And as I said, this is much nicer because we don't have to keep track of the indices. And let's remove this. And now we are working with dynamic lists using slice. So adding a value 
to a slice is different than to an array, but retrieving a value, getting a value from the slice is the same. So we can actually leave this syntax like this. We can change the wording here from array to slice. And now let's run our application again. And as you see, the slice basically has these brackets directly wrapped around the value it has and the length of a slice is one. So as we add new elements, it automatically expands. And finally, just as a reminder, note the alternative syntax for creating a slice. Just like with an array, we can also do an empty slice assignment like this or using this alternative syntax, we can also create slice with this syntax. So now we're actually saving user information in the bookings list. Let's actually clean this up before moving on. And instead, let us print all the bookings in the application. like this. And we actually need print F. And that's our cleaned up application code. Now, even though we are saving the data of the list of users who booked the ticket, we only always have just one user. Because when we run the application, we enter information, get the ticket and the application exits. Now, of course, in real life, this would be a web application with a UI and a database connected to it where multiple people can book at the same time from their browsers and the bookings will be persisted in a database. But in our case, we have a command line interface application. So we're using our application only through the terminal. So what we're going to do is create a constant loop where the application keeps asking for another ticket booking after one booking is done to simulate booking a ticket multiple times for different users. And loops, which is a concept that you may already know from other languages, is basically used whenever we need to repeat the same logic multiple times. Now, in Go specifically, loops are actually simplified. You don't have different types of loops like while loop and do while loop for each loop and so on. You just have one loop, which is a for loop, and you can use it for all the different use cases. So basically, you have for loop with different types. Our first case is super simple use case for a for loop, which is that we just want to allow booking over and over again. So after the welcome message, the logic, which basically asks for user input, and then books the tickets, and then prints out the summary of the booking need to be repeated. So right here at the beginning of this logic, we're going to write for. So that's the beginning of a for loop. And the syntax of a for loop is curly braces. So whatever we put within those curly braces gets repeated in this loop. So I'm going to take this whole thing and put it inside the for loop. And let's actually fix the indentation like this. So we put that logic inside the for loops block. And for each line, we have basically indentations like this. So that's it. This will basically keep asking for a new booking after one booking is done. And to test that, let's run the application. This is the first user. And now immediately after we got the output of the booking, first of all, these three lines right here. So we have 46 tickets remaining. And this is one booking in our bookings list. And immediately after that, it asks for another user's input. And let's fill it out. Let's do Nicole Smith and 
email address and let's say she books three tickets. And as you see, the remaining tickets got updated from 46 to 43, right? So minus three tickets. And now we have two bookings in our bookings list, the first user and the second user. And we can do this basically indefinitely for as many users as we want. So to break the application, you can do control C and this will basically interrupt and stop the application. But of course, when we start the application again, it will start from scratch, right? So the bookings variable as well as remaining tickets variable, of course, gets updated while the application is running, right? After each rerun, everything gets reset. Now let's do one more thing here. At the end of each booking, we're printing out the list of users who already bought the tickets. And we're printing out their first names and last names. But let's say we want to give our users a little bit of privacy. And instead of printing their full names, we want to only print their first names to display the bookings with a little bit of privacy. So basically, we want to go through our bookings list of full names, bookings slice, and for each entry of the full name, we want to extract only the first name part and then print only the first name. Again, we're doing the same thing over and over again to different elements of the bookings list. So it's a loop. But instead of an indefinite loop, like the one we're using here, that basically never ends, we want to loop through a specific list of elements. So let's see how we can do that. First of all, let's define a slice for only the first names. Let's call it first names. And let's use the shortcut syntax for this. So this is going to be a slice of first names, which are strings. And we're starting with an empty list. Now, when I save, of course, we get an error because we're not using it. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to loop through or iterate through our bookings list, grabbing one element at a time. And to iterate through a list, we have a pretty simple syntax, actually. We have for, again, for loop. And while we are iterating through this list, we get two values for each iteration. First, we get an index. And you learn the index from the arrays. It is basically a position of the element in the list. This is the first element, second element, and so on. So we get the index for each iteration, and we get the element itself. And we can call this element whatever we want. It's like defining a variable. Let's call it booking, because we have a bookings list. So each element inside will be a booking. Then we have a syntax of colon equals. And here we define what list are we actually iterating and getting these two values from, which is bookings. So we're iterating through bookings. And to iterate through a slice, we need a range expression. Range allows us to iterate over elements in different data structures, not just arrays or slices. But for slices and arrays specifically, it gives us back the index and value for each element. So this basically defines the whole logic of go through this list and for each iteration, give us index and the element value. And at the end, we have curly braces for defining logic for our for loop. So basically, we have a for loop inside another for loop. So inside these curly braces, we have access to each element stored in a booking variable and index of that variable one by one. So the, the booking variable has a full name, like Nicole Smith with a space character between. And in order to get the Nicole, the first name, we can simply split the whole string on a space character using Go's built-in function called fields, like this. And the fields function comes from strings package. So this will take our full name string, split it on empty space, 
and gives us a slice of strings separated by space, which in this case is Nicole and Smith, two values. So a slice with two elements. And we're going to save that into a variable called names. So names will basically be an array containing two elements, the first name and the last name. And you learned to get the first element of an array or slice, we just use index zero. And that's going to be our first name. Very easy. Now, of course, we're using a package and its function. So we need to import that package. And this is actually one of the cases that I mentioned at the beginning. If you want some functionality of Go, you probably will not know by heart in which package you have such a functionality available and what is the name of the function. So of course, in this case, you just Google how to separate strings on space or something similar and you get results probably from Go's official documentation that references this example. So let's go ahead and import this strings package right here. Now here we're just importing one package. We haven't actually needed any other, but if we want to import multiple packages, then we have to enclose it into brackets and each package should be on a new line like this and then close that bracket. And there you go. Now, if you scroll down, you see a bunch of red lines here, which are all about variables that are declared, but not used. And we're going to fix those one by one. First of all, we need to save this first name in our first names slice, right? Because we're basically going through these bookings and we're collecting a list of first names in this slice. And to add an element to a slice, remember we use the append function, which has the slice variable inside and the element that we're adding, which is actually first name. And we have to then assign it back to the slice variable like this. So again, we're defining a list variable here, a slice variable. And then within this loop, one by one, we're adding a first name to this first name slice. So at the end of the for loop, when we use first names here, it's going to have the list of all the first names from the bookings list. Now we can actually spare us this line here by just grabbing this value here and using it directly in the append. So we don't need an additional variable like this. So basically when the loop is done collecting the first names, we can print it out right here. Let's do the first names of bookings are, and then we have first names instead of the bookings. Now you see that we still have one error here that we need to fix before we can run our application. And that is the index variable that we created here is not being used because we don't actually need this index in our logic, but we can't just remove it and just leave booking here. It needs to be there because we are expecting two values here. So we have to save both of them in a variable. So instead we can fix the problem by simply using an underscore in its place, which is known as a blank identifier. In Go, underscores are used to identify unused variables. So basically we're saying there is a variable here, but we just want to ignore it because we don't need to use it. And if I save this, you see that error is gone. And that is because we're telling Go that we know that there is a variable defined here that we are explicitly not using. That's basically the idea of using underscore. So now with these changes, let's run our application again and see that only first names get printed out. And you see that our application logic works pretty good. We have updates in tickets after every booking. And at the end of each booking, we also get a list of first names printed out. And again, you can quit the application using control and C. 
Great, now we have two for loops in our replication, but the first one, the indefinite for loop, never ends. It keeps asking for the next booking. But what if all 50 tickets are booked out? We need to end the application and say that conference is sold out. So after every booking, we need to check if the remaining tickets is zero. And if it is, we end the application. Otherwise, we let it continue. And we do that using if else checks, which is a concept you have in all programming languages and is super easy. So let's see how it works. So at the end of the booking, within our indefinite for loop, right here, we make the check to see if the remaining tickets is zero. So no tickets are left. So we start with if keyword and the expression after the if keyword is called a condition like remaining tickets equals zero. And the data type of such conditional statement is a Boolean true or false. So either this statement is true, remaining tickets is really zero, or it's false. So we're telling the program, if this condition is true, then execute the code within these curly braces, or within the if statement block. If this condition is not true, then skip the execution of whatever code is defined here and skip to the next line, which in our case is the next iteration of our for loop. So if the remaining tickets is zero, we want to basically end the program. So here is going to be a logic for quitting the application. So first, let's actually print out a message for the user saying something like our conference is booked out, come back next year. And after that, we end the application. How do we do that? We basically break the loop using break keyword. So this will basically end the loop, which means the application execution is over because there's nothing after the for loop, right? Application ends. So as I said, this expression here, or the value of this expression is of a Boolean data type. So we should have a Boolean type keyword for that and be able to create variables of that type as well, right? Just like for other data types. So I could actually take this whole expression and save it into a variable, which we can call no tickets remaining, which is of a Boolean type. And then we can use this variable as a conditional of the if statement. Again, with an alternative syntax, we can write this expression like this. And by the way, note the syntax for double equal signs here instead of one equal sign. So one equal sign is for assigning values to variables. Double equal sign is for comparing two values to each other. Again, nothing specific to Go. This is actually same in all the programming languages. Now, since we're using this variable only once here, there's actually no need to save this expression into a separate variable. So I'm going to change it back to before and leave it directly in the if statement. So let's actually test that our logic works and the application ends when users have booked all 50 tickets. So let's run the application, provide the data, and let's actually take all 50 tickets at once, like this. And as you see, after it printed the first names of bookings right here, it went to the next line, saw that remaining tickets equals zero is true. So it, So this condition was true. And because of that, it actually executed these two lines and it printed out our conference is booked out, come back next year, and it broke out of the loop, which ended the program. Now, this makes sure that the program ends when all tickets are booked. But what if a user wants to book more tickets than available? So what if I typed 52 instead of 50? Let's see what would happen in this case with our application. So let's run it again. 
and I'm going to book 52 tickets. And this is the output. First of all, we have this weird number of tickets remaining. And second, the application didn't end. It actually continues to ask for another user input. So as you see, our application cannot handle when user wants to book more than available number of tickets. And the reason why application didn't end, even though we exceeded the ticket amount, is because the remaining tickets is not a zero anymore. It's this number here. That's why these two lines were not executed. So let's fix this issue. And to do that, before the booking happens, right here, where we take the remaining tickets and we deduct the user tickets from it, before that even happens, we need to check. So we need another if statement to check whether user tickets is greater than the remaining tickets. So if user is trying to book more tickets than is available. Again, very easy. We have if and then condition which says user tickets is more than remaining tickets, right? So this is going to be an invalid input from the user. So we need to tell the user something like we only have this many tickets remaining. So you can't book so many tickets. And let's substitute those values. So we have remaining tickets. And this is the user tickets that they're trying to book. So we inform the user about their wrong input. But we also have to end the program. Because if this is true, then all this rest of the code should not be executed, right? The ticket should not be booked. So same as right here, we break from the loop, which ends the program. So this break here will basically tell Go to skip execution of the rest of the code in the iteration and stop the loop. So all of this will be skipped. So let's test our logic. And try with 52 again. And as you see, the program says we only have 50 tickets remaining, so you can't book 52 tickets. And as you see, none of the next lines gets executed, and the program exits. So now we are handling an invalid input from the user to protect our application from the outcome that we saw previously. Now let's say we don't want to end the application if user wants to book more tickets than remaining. We want to allow them to try to book again with the corrected number of tickets. So we don't want to stop the for loop completely with break. We want to tell the user, hey, you're trying to book an incorrect number of tickets, so please try again. So we want to skip all of this to the next iteration of the for loop instead of breaking out of the for loop completely. And we can do that also very easily using another instruction called continue. So instead of break, we say continue to the next iteration. So continue, just like break, will skip all of this. But instead of ending the loop, it will basically go to the next iteration of the loop. So let's try that as well. Let's do 52 again. And you see the message gets printed out. You can't book so many tickets, but it skips to the next iteration and it starts with enter your first name again. So user has another chance to enter a correct amount. So this makes our application a little bit more user friendly. Now, what if we wanted to check for the reverse condition and check if user wants to book less tickets than available or exactly the same number. How could we do that? First, we change the expression to less than or equal. So user tickets is either exactly same as remaining tickets or is less. And we say if this condition is true, so it's a valid input from the user, then everything is great. They can book the ticket. So this whole logic here can be executed. 
So instead of these two lines, I'm going to put this outside of the if block. So instead, this logic will be executed. So we are reversing the check. And don't forget to fix the indentation here. So if this condition is true, then this logic should be executed, which actually books the tickets. Now, what about this code here? Where does this logic go? Well, after the if block is finished, we add an else statement, which says otherwise. So if this is not true, it's false. In that case, execute code in this block. And that's where this logic will go. So basically, either at any iteration, either the if block will get executed or else block, right? So this is an if else statement. And this basically logic wise does exactly the same as before, we just changed the condition here. And because only one of those blocks will be executed, we don't need the continue part here to skip the booking logic, right? Because the booking logic is in its own block, so to say. So let's move the continue and save. And if I test this again, and try 52, you will see the error message. So this line was executed, the else block basically, and without the continue keyword, it skipped to the next iteration because that's actually the next line of the code after the else block. Now, let's say we wanted to do something different if the user tickets and remaining tickets were exactly equal. So if that was the case, we wanted to do something completely different than what we're doing here or here. So where could we put this logic? In that case, we would split up this condition so here we would say, if user tickets is less than remaining tickets, then do whatever is defined here. Otherwise, else if user tickets is exactly equal to remaining tickets, then do something else. And finally, if none of these are true, so if this is false and this is also false, then execute the else block. And you can have as many else if statements in between if and else as you want, but you can only have one if statement and one final else statement. Now let's revert this because we're not doing anything different here. And let's revert back to our if else statement. Now there is another place where we use conditionals that are true or false, and that's in for loops. So in addition to looping through a list like this, we can also say execute the code in a loop for as long as a specific condition is true. Like execute code in this block within this for loop for as long as remaining tickets is more than zero or as long as the size of the bookings list is less than 50, or even a combination of both, like this. So we can use the same conditions that we saw in if else statements as the for loop conditions and tell our program to execute whatever code is inside that for loop as long as this condition is true. As soon as it becomes false, the for loop execution is over. Now you may be thinking at this point, why didn't we have any condition in our infinite for loop? Why doesn't it say anything? Well, since the conditions can be true or false, an infinite loop can be written by using condition true. So basically hard coding a static true will make this loop an infinite loop. And that's what we have. And whenever we have that, we can just leave out the condition and have for loop with no condition. And that's going to be the same as saying for true. And that's why we don't have to explicitly specify a condition. 
But again, as I said, if you want to write a for loop that only runs as long as a specific condition is true, you can define that condition right here. Another common use case for if else statements is user input validation. In our application, we're allowing users to enter their data, but users don't always enter data correctly, either intentionally or unintentionally. And we developers must make sure that our application doesn't crash when user puts in bad input. So we have to make sure that our application is so robust that it can actually handle any type of bad user input. And the way to do that is to always check whether the user input contains valid information, any unexpected values, and so on. So in our case, let's check a couple of things in user input that we're expecting. So these are the four pieces of data that we are getting from the user, and we want to check all of those. First, let's check that the names that user provides are valid, the first name and last name. And let's say the valid name for us is a string with at least two characters. Now, if the user provided a wrong name, this would not crash the application, but we want to make sure that users are not spamming our application and are actually giving correct information. At least we try to partially check that. And again, we have to do the validation part before the booking logic gets executed, right? Because if they entered invalid data, we don't allow the booking. So right here, let's check that first name and last name length is at least two characters, but we're not going to do anything with it yet. We will just save it into a variable and use it later. Now to check the length of a string, we have the built-in function called len length, which you already learned from arrays and slices. So for arrays and slices, this checks the size of the list for strings, it checks the size of the characters. So how many characters are in a string? So first name length should be at least two. So it can be two as well. That's why we're going to do greater than or equal to two. And the same should be true for the last name. So in addition to that, we also want to validate last name in the same statement. And we can do that, or we can chain these two conditions using end characters. Again, note the double ampersand signs. So this basically says this condition and this condition. So this is going to be check for the last name. And whatever value of this expression, again, assign it to a Boolean variable. And we're going to call it is valid name. Again, we can skip the Boolean type because Go can imply from the value that it's a Boolean type. So we can save that and we can also use the alternative syntax like this. So again, if user entered the first name that is at least two characters long and last name, which is also at least two characters long, then this whole thing will be true and we're going to assign that true to is valid name variable. Now, if any one of those is false, so if first name is valid, but last name is not, or vice versa, then this whole expression will be also false. And that false value will then be assigned to is valid name variable. Now let's validate the email address. And let's say for email address, we want to make sure they're not entering an invalid email format. So we're going to check that the value of email or the string contains the it sign. Now you already learned the strings package from which we use this fields function. And the same strings package actually has a function called contains that takes a string as a first input and then a character or multiple characters that we want to search in that string. And this will actually give us a Boolean result back. So if the string contains this character or these characters, then it will give us true back. If not, then it's going to be false. So we can call this is 
valid email. And assign this whole value to it. So we assume if email user gave us contains this character, then it is a valid email. If not, then it's not valid. And finally, let's check the user tickets and validate that user didn't enter a number of tickets which is negative or zero. So it has to be positive number greater than zero. So again, user tickets is more than zero will be a valid ticket count. Now we have another check for the user tickets, which is that it's less than remaining tickets. So a user cannot book more tickets than available. So that's going to be another validation for this input. And we can actually add that right here. Also with this end sign. So both of these expressions need to be true so that we have a valid user ticket. If any one of those is wrong, let's say user tickets is a positive number, but it's more than remaining tickets, then it's going to be invalid input. So let's call this is valid ticket number. And here we have our user input validations. So as I said, we can chain multiple conditions like this with double end sign to make sure both of these are true to give us a valid ticket number. We can also chain conditions with or instead of end. Let's say the conference is taking place in two cities, Singapore and London, and user can choose which one they want to go to or which location they want to attend. So they can choose between those two cities, but they can't enter some random city that is not valid. So in that case, we could have a check is valid city, where let's say if we had the city as an input, we would check if it's either Singapore or London. So city cannot have both of these values, right? It has to have either Singapore or London. If it has some other value, then it is an invalid city. But if it's valid, then it should be either or. So in this case, we chain this condition using or instead of int. Well, sometimes we need to check whether the user did not enter a specific value. For example, let's say we want to check is invalid city, which means user didn't enter either Singapore so the city is not Singapore and it's also not London. So basically, if both of these conditions are true, so the city, the value of the city is not Singapore and is not London, then is invalid city is true. So this here is a negation or not equal. And it may be a little bit confusing than positive statements like equal or greater than, etc. So if this is more confusing than the previous statement, then what you could also do is revert this back to is valid city. And then using that exclamation mark, you can negate the result of this. So basically, this statement with exclamation mark is valid city is exactly the same as the negative check that I just showed you. And you could use this in the if statement, of course, like this. Okay, now let's clean up all these examples. And go back to our user input checks. We have saved all these checks in variables. So now it's time to use those variables in the if statement and execute the booking only if all the user input values are valid. And skip the booking if at least one of those user inputs are invalid. So if name and email are correct, but the ticket number is invalid, of course, we want to skip the booking. So in the if statement, we check if is valid name is true, and is valid email is also true, and is valid ticket number is also true. So all three have to be true in order to execute the booking. So again, we're chaining this with end symbols, which means 
All of these three have to be true in order to execute the booking. And if I save this, we also get rid of the error. And if any of the user inputs is wrong, we're going to inform the users about that saying using a simple message that says your input data is invalid. Try again. Let's save it. And let's actually test that our validation logic works. So I'm going to put in first name, which is just a one character and all the other stuff are correct. And as you see, we get invalid data input. Let's now try a wrong email address without the at sign. And again, invalid input data. And you can also test ticket number and so on. So now we have some kind of protection in our application against bad user input. As I said, the bad or invalid user input can be intentional or unintentional. Sometimes users accidentally enter wrong information. So we could optimize our application to tell the user what they actually entered incorrectly so they can correct it. So instead of this generic message here, which says your input data is invalid, we're going to say exactly what they entered wrong. So right here, we're going to have if statements that check which of the inputs were actually wrong. So we're going to say if is valid name is not true. Remember the negation with exclamation mark. So if name is invalid, so this translates to is invalid name. In that case, we're going to print first name or last name you entered is too short. We're going to do the same for email. And we're going to say if email is invalid or if is valid email is not true, we're going to print a message that says email address you entered does not contain at sign. And finally, is not valid ticket number, we're going to say number of tickets you entered is invalid. And we don't need this generic message here. And note that we don't have else here, we just have if statements, because we want each of these statements to be executed, because they might have entered all this data wrong, wrong name, wrong email, wrong ticket number. So in that case, we want to say your name is wrong, your email is wrong, the number of tickets is invalid. If this were else if conditions like this, and user had entered invalid name, then this would be true. And this line would be executed. And the else blocks will be skipped. Because as I said, with if else, or if else if statements, only one of the blocks gets executed, not all of them, or not multiple of them. And that's why we're gonna revert it back to if statements. And now, Let's actually try to input a bunch of wrong data like this. Wrong email, number of tickets zero, and we get all of these messages. It says the name is too short, email is invalid, and number of tickets is also invalid. So now user knows exactly what they entered wrong. So as you see, if else statements are super important in applications, because they basically control the whole application flow. It's like a decision tree, right? We do different things based on different conditions. Now let's see another concept in programming, which is similar to if else statements, which is switch statement. Let's say our conference is held in six different cities. And for most of these cities, we have different booking processes and the data we're asking from users. 
So the application logic is basically different based on for which city you want to book the conference ticket. So at the beginning of the application, we need to check which city user selected. And based on that selection, we then execute a different code block. Now, if we have to check for six different cities, having six if else statements may not be optimal. And for such cases, we have switch statements. Now, we're not going to execute this code. So I'm just going to show you the example syntax right here of how switch statements actually look like. So let's say we have this city variable that user basically selects. And let's say the user selected London. And right here, we need to check which of the six cities user wants to book tickets for. So first, we have the switch keyword that checks the value of city. And here we have multiple cases. So case one is city value equals New York, in which case we want to execute code for booking New York conference tickets. Another case or another possible value for city is Singapore. And again, here we would execute code for booking a Singapore conference tickets. In other case, let's say we have London. Again, some code here. And I'm just going to copy. And let's do Mexico City. And finally, Hong Kong. And after each case, we have, we need the colon. So all of these are possible values for city. So these are where the conferences are held. But as I said, users sometimes enter invalid data. So we also need to handle when the city has none of these values. And that's going to be a default case in the switch statement. So basically, when none of these are true, then we execute a code block, which let's say prints out no valid city selected. So that's like the else in the if else statement. So switch just like if else basically controls the application flow and based on a value of whatever variable we pass into switch, we execute a different logic in our application. Now let's say the booking logic for London and Berlin is the same, as well as booking logic for Singapore and Hong Kong is also the same. So in this case, we don't want to duplicate the code. Instead, we want to consolidate those two cases, saying if the city is London or Berlin, then execute this code. And we can also do that in switch statement by listing all the possible values like this. And this will be the same logic for London and Berlin. And as I said, for these two cities as well, like this. So basically, in switch statements, you can also consolidate multiple values and execute a certain logic for multiple values. So that's how switch statements work. Again, let's clean this up and get back to our booking logic. Now, our super simple application became already pretty crowded. We have all this code in our main function that keeps on growing. So it would be nice to start cleaning it up by taking parts of the code that do one specific thing and putting them in functions with some descriptive name. So we encapsulate a code block into its own container called a function, give it a name that makes it immediately clear what that code block does and use that block of code simply by calling the function by its name. So let's see how to write functions in Go. 
Well, in fact, we have already created a function at the beginning, which was the main function. So the same way, after the main function ends, right here, that's the end of the main function block, we create another one using a func keyword, then again, name of the function, and let's call this one greet users. And after that, we have, again, function block using the curly braces. So each function has its own block. And when we call the function, then whatever code is inside those curly braces gets executed, like a print statement, which says, welcome to our conference. So we have created a simple function that basically just prints out welcome to our conference. Now, when we run our application, this code will not get executed because when we create or define a function, it basically just stores whatever code is inside for later use, but it doesn't actually execute it. For that, we need to explicitly execute or call the function inside the main function, because this is, as I mentioned at the very beginning, this is the function that Go will look for to start the execution. So if we create other functions, we have to explicitly call them inside the main function so that code inside them gets executed. And calling a function is super easy. Let's say right here at the beginning, we want to call greet users function that will then print out the welcome message. So if we run our application, we have this welcome to our conference, which comes from greet users function. And then of course we have whatever we define in the main. Now let's say we want to greet users with the conference name instead of just a generic welcome to our conference. So basically the same way as we're doing right here. So how can we give the greet users function the value of the conference name variable, which we defined here? Well, we can pass it as an input parameter. So we can hand it over to greet users function saying, here's the value of conference name variable. You can use it inside your function block in your code. By just passing it within the brackets. But we also need to tell the function itself that it is expecting a parameter. We can just throw some parameters to a function randomly. We have to expect it explicitly here as well. So in the function definition within the brackets, we're going to define that parameter using either the same name as the variable that we're using, or we can also give it a completely different name. It's up to us. So we can call it whatever we want. And we also have to specify its type because remember variables in Go have to have types. So we're telling this function, you're expecting an input parameter called conf name, which is of type string. So think of this as a variable inside a function. This is very similar to doing this inside a function. And that's actually what happens in the background when the function gets called. And then you can use this variable or this variable inside this function block. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to say, welcome to booking application and use the conf name value. So now if we run the application and we forgot the new line here, we got exactly same output as on this line. So we basically extracted this code into a function. So we don't need this one. And let's actually put the whole greeting logic into our greet function. So I'm going to take this and in the greet users function, let's edit right here. And the same way that we pass the conference name, we also need to pass these two values because we have to have them available within the function. So we have to pass them as input parameters. And as I said, we can call this whatever we want, like conf tickets, which is integer 
and let's call the other one remaining tickets, which is u integer, unsigned integer, like this. And of course, now whenever we call this function, we have to pass all three parameters. Otherwise, we're going to get an error, like here. It says not enough arguments. So let's pass those two values as well. First one is conference tickets, this value, and then we have the remaining tickets. Save, and the error is gone. So we replaced this print lines with a function call like this, which makes our main function a little bit cleaner. And now if we run the application, we should actually get exactly the same output as before we had the function. And as you see, we have our welcome statement. All the values are substituted. Everything looks fine. So we extracted first group of code into a function and gave it some descriptive name that says this will greet the users. Now let's take the code for picking out the first names, so this code block here, and put it in a function called print first names, because that's what it does, right? It goes through the bookings and it prints the first names of the people who booked the tickets. So I'm going to cut this whole thing out. So here we will call function print first names. And right here, we're going to create that function with the name, again, descriptive name, print first names. Again, function block, and all the code that I copied will go inside. If I save, again, you'll see that we need some values as an input because we don't have them available here. So Go doesn't know where this bookings variable comes from. It's not available inside this function. So we have to pass it as a parameter. And we're going to define it here. Bookings is a slice of strings. So the type is going to be square brackets and string. That's it. And if I save this, error will disappear. Now we have to actually call this function. Otherwise, the first names will not be printed out. So function call, and we have to pass bookings as a parameter. That's it. We have extracted another block of code or another logic into its own function. Now, let's say we wanted to print the first names actually in the main function. So we only want to pick the first names from the bookings slice in this function, but the final printing so this line here should actually be done in the main function for whatever reason. So instead of printing the first names, we want this function to actually just return the first names to the main function so that main can print it itself. So instead of this line, we want return first names. So return keyword, as you see the highlight here, says that this function is doing some logic and then returning a result of that logic back to the main function. And we have an error here because whenever we are returning something from a function, we also have to specifically say that in the function definition, that we are returning a value of a certain type. In our case, first names is also a slice of strings. So that's what we're returning. So note that Within those brackets, we have the input parameters, and outside those brackets, we have output parameters with a type of the output we're returning. And this print line should go back to the main function. And if I save this, of course, main function doesn't know this variable because we should get that from this function right here. And let's actually rename this function now because it now doesn't print the first names, it just returns or gets the first names. And whenever function actually returns something to us, we can save that return value into a variable. And let's call this variable first names because that's what we need here. Equals 
first names is a result of whatever get first names function gives us. And that's it. So our function does its thing, its logic, it gives us a result, and then we take that result in the main function like this and do something with it, like print it out. Let's see what else can we extract here. Another candidate for its own function can be the user input validation. So I'm going to take this logic and let's actually create another function called validate user input. And again, let's fix the indentation like this. By now, you already know how this works. We need to define all the variables that we're using here. We need to define them as input parameters. So first name, which is a string, last name, also a string, email, also a string, and user tickets, which is integer, finally, or it's actually uint, and finally remaining tickets, which is also you int. And if I save, all these errors are gone. And we're going to call this function with all the input parameters we defined. So we have the first name, last name, email, user tickets, and remaining tickets. Like this. However, now we don't have these three variables available in the main function anymore. That's why we have these errors here, because it doesn't recognize these variables, and we have errors here as well. So we need those three values actually available in the main function. So we need to return all three values back to the main function. Well, in most programming languages, you cannot do that. You cannot return multiple values from a function, you can always return just one value. But in Go, you can return any number of values you want from a function, which I think is pretty cool because there are many use cases for this. And it works the same way as returning just one value. We just say return. And we just list any values or variables that we want to return. like this. And of course, the same way as with one return value, we have to define the types, the data types of all the return values in order, which we do outside those parentheses. And when we have multiple returns, we have to also enclose them in its own separate parentheses. So within this block, we're going to define the data types of these three values, which are all Boolean true or false values. So this is going to be Boolean 1, Boolean 2, Boolean 3. So again, input values in the first parentheses, input parameters, and then in the second one, a list of output parameter types. And now that we're returning these three values, it's time to grab them or collect them outside here. And that is also pretty easy. We can just list them one by one like is valid name, is valid email, is valid ticket number, save, and there you go. Now all these three variables are available in the main function. So the errors are gone. So let's check our code. We have these three functions that we created and our main function got smaller and maybe more descriptive. Now let's also extract the code for getting user input in a function. So I'm going to grab this whole code till here. And save it into a separate function. And let's call this get user input. Fix the indentation. And as you see, get user input function doesn't need any input parameters, because we're asking for input from the users. So we don't need anything from the main function. However, inside the main function, we need those values because we're doing all the processing based on whatever user entered, right? So we have to actually return all this input data back to the main. So 
return first name, last name, email, and use the tickets. And again, we have to specify the types of those right here. So first name, last name, email, and use the tickets. And in the main, just like we did right here, we're gonna grab those values one by one. So we have the first name, last name, email, and user tickets. And if I save this, you see all the errors are gone because now we have these four values available here as well. And finally, let's take the code for booking the application, actually this whole logic here, and also put it in its own function. And logically, we're going to call this function book ticket. And if I save, you see a bunch of errors because we don't have these values available here. So we need a lot of input parameters for this function. So let's define them one by one. Remaining tickets, user tickets, bookings, which is a slice of strings. And we have the first name, last name, email, and finally, we also need the conference name, which is also a string. And if I save, it all looks fine. When we call this function in the main, so this is where book ticket happens, we're going to pass all those defined parameters, which is a long list of values. Now here you may be wondering, if I have to pass so many parameters to my function, does it make my code cleaner? That's a lot of repeated code because we're passing all these same values and parameters to different functions. So to reduce this repetition a bit, we can define variables that are shared among multiple functions. So variables that are accessible both for main and other functions as well without having to pass them around like this. So it makes sense to create those variables in a place that lets multiple functions, including the main, have access to them. And these are called package level variables. And these are variables defined outside from all the functions. So instead of defining these variables inside the main, we're gonna take them and instead define them outside on a package level like this. And now they're not only accessible to main, but also to all the functions in this package. Now, if I save this, you see we have two errors. And that is because the package level variables cannot be created using this syntax. They need the syntax with var keyword. So if I save this, you see the error is gone. We'll do the same here. And that's it. We can also take the put the constant at the top like this. So now, as I said, we don't have to pass those variables to other functions from main because these functions also have access to them directly. So in the grid users function, for example, we were passing three of these variables as parameters. Now we don't need this anymore because grid users can access those variables directly. So I'm gonna delete this and save. And we have an error because now the names of the variables have to be exactly what is defined here, right? So conference name like this, conference tickets, and that's it. We have no errors and no need to pass those values as input parameters. Again, makes the function execution much cleaner. We also have the bookings array, which is defined on a package level. So we don't need to pass that here as well. So I'm going to remove this from get first names and remove this 
here as well. Again, everything works. Same thing right here, validate user input. We're passing it remaining tickets as a variable, which it doesn't need anymore. But it still needs those four variables, obviously, because they are still created in the main function and not available directly outside. So let's go to validate user input and remove this last parameter. And finally, our book ticket function that has this long list of parameters. We can get rid of remaining tickets bookings and conference name as parameters because they are all defined here. So remove this one and if I save, everything looks fine again. Now you may be thinking, why not define all the variables at the top right here and then make them accessible everywhere in our functions. Well, this would be a bad practice because generally you want to define a variable as locally as possible. So basically create a variable where you need it. So if you need a variable only inside a specific function or a specific block inside the function, then you should define it there. So now if we look at our main function, you see that the code is way cleaner we have descriptive function names that basically tells us what exactly is happening within the main function. We're greeting the users, then we're getting their inputs, we're validating that input, and if everything is valid, we're booking the ticket, then getting the first names and printing them, and if the remaining tickets is zero, we just end the program. And all this logic that was basically crowding the main function is now encapsulated in its own small functions. Now let's actually test that everything still works fine. And there you go. We have the thank you message, the ticket number got updated correctly, and we have the first names of the bookings printed here. So everything works same as before. Now, in addition to just cleaning things up, functions have another important purpose, which is that same block of code can be reused in many different places in your application by calling the function name, just like variables where we define something once and reuse it 100 times. So for example, if you were hosting 10 conferences at the same time and needed to ask for and validate user input, you can reuse that code for all 10 conferences instead of writing that same logic 10 times. Now we've been working in one single file this whole time. So you're maybe asking, what if I'm writing a more complex Go application with a lot of logic so do I put all the stuff in one Go file or how does it work? Can we create multiple Go files that all belong to the same project? Well, remember at the beginning I said that Go is organized into packages and the package is a collection of Go files, which can be one file or several files. And we already have one package that we called main, which we created. And we also have one Go file for that package, which we called main.go. Now, if our code got larger, we can split it into multiple files. So for example, if we had 10 different conferences for which users could book the tickets on our application, we could create own files for each conference booking. Plus, if we had multiple files where we defined bookings for different conferences, we might have code that is shared by all these files. So we may need the same functionality in all 10 conference bookings. For example, we might need the same user input validation in all our files. So we could have a separate file for such shared functionalities as well. And all these files could belong to the same package. So to demonstrate that, I'm going to create a file here and let's call it helper.go or we can also call it common or shared.go and this can include functions 
that are helper functions of the main application. Again, as an example, we can take user input validation. The first thing we need to define here is which package this Go file belongs to. And we have the main package that we created and we want this file to also belong to that main package. So that's one thing we need to define in each file. And then we basically just need to put some functionality here or list of functions that we can reference from other files. Again, if I had 10 different files here that all share the functions right here, we could basically define them here in helper go and then reference it from everywhere. So I'm going to grab validate user input function from here. And I'm going to put it into a helper dot go file. So we're basically splitting our code into multiple files. Of course, we need to import the strings package here because we're using it. And if I save this, everything is error free in helper.go as well as main.go. So basically, it is super easy to divide your code up into multiple files that all belong to the same package. Because we're referencing this validate user input in the main.go file right here. And it knows exactly that this function comes from the helper.go file. Now we want to validate that everything works and run our application. However, if I run my application like this with go run main.go and execute, you see that it says validate user input is not defined on line 21. So right here. So this function is not defined. And that is because we need to now run the application with all the files that belong to that application. So now we have main.go and helper.go. So we have to provide both files to go run command. And now if I execute, everything works again. And let's add some invalid input here to make sure the validate user input also works. And as you see, we have the messages about wrong user input. Now, of course, if you have tens of files here in your application, it's not very convenient to have to pass them one by one to go run command. So as an alternative, you can just specify a folder location from which you want to execute the files. So all the files in this folder will be executed and dot specifies the current folder, which is the booking app. So we're telling go to run application with all the files in the current folder. And again, it works fine. So that's going to be a better alternative, of course, if you have multiple files in your Go project. So now we have this helper.go file that belongs to the same main package. However, we could actually organize our application code into multiple packages. So in addition to the main package, we can have other packages that all belong to the application. So what could be a use case for that? Let's say we have an application that handles booking for 10 different conferences. And the booking logic for each conference is almost completely different. In that case, we could actually create own packages for each of the conference and put the booking logic there. And plus, let's say they share some common logic like validating user input. And that could also be a separate package that all other packages may share. So basically, these multiple packages helps you organize your code and group the logic in a way that makes sense for your application. So this is a way to logically group your code. So let's say in our example, we wanted to put this helper functionality in its own package. And let's call this package also helper. When we have multiple packages, we should actually create folders for them and then put all the files belonging to that package in that folder. So I'm going to create a folder called helper and put the helper.go file in that folder. Again, this helps organize our code and basically visually represent 
the separation as well. Now, of course, we need to make a couple of adjustments for our application to work again. The first thing is, if we go to the main.go file, right here where the function is being called, you see that it says undeclared names because Go doesn't know this function anymore. It doesn't know where it's coming from. And that's why it says undeclared name. So while this function was in the same package, Go was able to find it without a problem. But now that we've moved it to another package, it is not recognized anymore in the main package. And remember at the very beginning, I said that whenever we need to use a function from another package in our main package, we need to explicitly import that package and then we will be able to use any functions inside that. And that applies to the packages that we create ourselves. So the first step will be to actually import the helper package in our main package if we want to use any functions defined inside right here. Now the question here is, can we just import it using its name like this, helper? Well, just writing the helper, the name of the package is not going to work because Go will try to look for a helper package in one of its built in modules. But this is actually our own package. So we have to explicitly tell Go, hey, this is actually a package in our application or in our module. So remember this go.mod file that we initiated at the beginning, this mod file or module file actually defines the name of the module, which we called booking dash app, which is also an import path for all the packages defined in this module. So if we want to import a helper package inside the main package, we have to use the booking app, the module name, before as a path. So now we are telling Go, import the helper package from our booking app module. And if we hover, you see that it was able to find that package. Now we just get an error because we're not using it. So how do we use a function from another package? Simply using the package name dot function name, just like we've been doing this whole time. So helper dot and then name of the function. Now there is one more thing we need to do for this to work. And right now you see that we have an error that says validate user input or the name of the function is not exported by package. So what does this mean? Whenever we want to create a function in a package that can be used in another package, we have to explicitly export that function. So it can be imported in another package. So exporting basically means we want to make this function available for use in other packages. And many programming languages have this concept of exporting functions to make it available for use in other places. And they all do it in different ways. In Go, the way to export a function is actually pretty easy. We just capitalize the name of that function like this. And that's it. This simple change in the background will actually export the validate user input function. So let's save it, go back to main and adjust the function name here. And you see the error is gone. And now we are able to use that function from another package in our main application. And you probably also noticed before that whenever we were using a function from an imported package like FMT or strings or whatever, we were using that function name with capital letter, right? So all the FMT package functions start with capital letter. We have printf with capital P, println. Here we have strings.fields with capital F. So that is the same concept right here. These are functions that have been exported in these packages and that's why we're able to use them. And by the way, you can not only export functions from other packages, but you can also export variables also by capitalizing the variable name. So for example, if 
all the conferences had the same number of tickets available, you could define that in this helper package as a variable and then export it simply by using a capitalized variable name. And finally, we have an error here because remaining tickets variable is not available anymore for this function. And that's again because we moved this function from a main package. And main package right here defines a package level variable called remaining tickets, which is only available within the package main. That's why it's called package level. So it's not visible to other packages. Again, as I said, we could export this variable using uppercase in the name, but in our case, we will just pass the variable as an input parameter. So let's do that, validate user input. And of course, we have to also edit in the function specification and remaining tickets is of uint type. And that fixes the last issue. And our application should work again. So if I execute the application, everything works fine again. And one more thing that I want to note here is all the places we have created variables. First of all, we have created variables within individual functions, which made these variables available only within those functions. So these are basically what's called local or function level variables. We also created variables that were available only within a specific block of code, like right here. So this names variable, it only exists within this for loop. So outside that, even within the function, the variable names does not exist. So you couldn't use it outside that for loop. It's undeclared. Then we saw how to define variables on a package level so that multiple functions can access it directly. So we define them right here. And finally, I mentioned that if we have variables that we want to share across packages, then we could create what's called a global variable using a capitalized variable name. And the concept of where we create variables and where we can use them is called variable scope. Okay, so we have split our application into multiple packages. And as I said, with multiple packages, you can organize your code more logically. Now for the simplicity, we're gonna revert our example back to helper.go being in a main package and continue with the rest of the demo examples from that state. Great, now we have organized our code a bit. We have cleaned it up with functions. We have divided our code into multiple files and so on. But there is one thing we want to optimize in our application. Right now, whenever a user completes a booking, we're saving only their full name in the bookings list. But the email address and the number of tickets they provided during the booking just get ignored and thrown away. We're not saving them. But we would like to have that information also saved for each user on the list of bookings. Maybe to send them information via email in the future or during the event to kind of validate how many tickets they have booked. Now, bookings, in our case, is a slice, which allows us to save a list of string values, which are the full names. But instead of just a simple string like this, we want a data type with multiple key value pairs per user. So something like first name and its value, last name and its value, email and number of tickets. So instead of a list of this type of values, we want a list of this kind of data block for each user. And the data type that will allow storing multiple key value pairs per user is called a map. So a construct, a data type that basically lets us save information about users like this is provided by map. 
And map is a common data type in many other programming languages as well. So for each user, we'll have a map with key names like this and their respective values, which of course will be different for each user. So let's see how we can turn our bookings list from a list of strings to a list of maps. First of all, let's go to the book ticket function where we're adding users first name and last name to the bookings list. And right before that, we're going to create a map for a user. And as I said, map is a data type. So just like with any other data type, we need to create a variable of an empty map. And we're going to call this, let's say a user or user data. Now, how do we create a map? First of all, we have a keyword map, and then we have to define types for the key and a value. As I said, map is a collection of key value pairs. And for each one, so for the for the keys, which are first name, last name, email, etc., we have to define what data type they are. And we also have to define the data types of the values. And of course, these two can be different. The keys in the map may be strings and the values may be integers. But in our case, we have strings for both of them. However, this only defines the type of the map, right? Just like we have a type of a slice, right? So this is this is a type of a slice, we have a type for a map, which is this one right here. So this is only a type, what we actually need to do is create an empty map. And we see that in the error as well, it says type definition is not an expression. So we need an expression which is creating an empty map. And to create an empty map, we have a built in function called make. And if I save, now we only get an error that user data is defined, but not used. So that will give us an empty map. So map creation is done. As a next step, we want to add all the user data we have available to this user data map. How do we add data key value pairs to a map? Very simple, actually. We have name of the map and the square brackets syntax that you already know from arrays and slices. And inside that we have the key name, which is first name, and the value to that, which is the value of the first name variable. So that's the first key value pair that we're saving into user data map. Let's save another key value pair, which is last name. And again, value will be the last name variable, which we get from the user input. And we have the email, which also comes from variable called email. So now we have added three key value pairs to user data map. So the key names are strings as we defined here, and the values are also strings as we defined here. And note that you can call these key names whatever you want. So this could be A, B, C, it doesn't really matter, right? But of course, you want to have some descriptive names which tells you what this key actually refers to. Okay, now the fourth data we have is number of tickets, but the user tickets value is a uint. It's not a string, right? So the value type is not a string. And in Go specifically, as we saw here, map can only have the same data type as keys and the same data type for values. So we cannot mix different data types as values. Again, specific to Go because in many programming languages, you can actually have mixed data types in a map, just like in a slice where we also have to have just one data type. 
which is again specific for Go because in many other programming languages you can actually have mixed data types. So what do we do here? How do we add the user tickets value in our user data map? Well, an easy way to handle this is to convert the user tickets u integer to a number character. So basically, if user bought 30 tickets, instead of 30 like this, we're going to have three zero as characters. And that will make it a string. And this type of conversion, there is a built-in function in Go called format uint. And this function comes from a package called string convert or str conv stands for string conversion. And this package basically includes different functions for converting strings to and from other data types. And one of them is converting uint to string. So of course we need to pass in our uint value so that it can be converted to a string. And we do that by using another built-in function called uint64, which is for a uint64 data type. So that's the value we're converting to a string like this. And then we have to pass another input parameter here, which stands for decimal number, base 10. So now you don't need to understand every part of this conversion, but shortly explained, format uint function takes our uint value, which may be anything 1 to 50, and formats it to a string as a decimal number. And 10 is for base 10, which represents decimal numbers. So another example would be 16, for example, that represents hexadecimal numbers. So that's what's going on here. Again, no need to go into details here, because usually if you need these type of conversions in your code, you would either check out the official documentation of Go, or you will just Google it and see the example code for that. So you don't have to memorize these kind of conversions. So as a result, this will actually give us our user tickets in string format, and we can then save it into our map. And this is going to be a key name for that, which we can name whatever we want. I'm going to call it number of tickets. And that is going to equal to this. And of course, we shouldn't forget to import the string conversion package like this, and everything looks fine. Cool. So now we are creating a map for each user because this book ticket function gets executed every time a new user books a ticket. So the map is getting created and all the user data gets saved into that map. So now we need to actually take that map with all the user data and add it to the bookings list. Right now we have a slice of strings as bookings. So first we need to make bookings variable into a slice of maps. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the type of this map. And right here, instead of the string type, I'm going to set a map type. So we're having a list of maps and not anymore a list of strings. Now this curly braces was used to create an empty list of strings. However, it doesn't work anymore for maps. So we need to actually create an empty slice of maps. And the syntax for that is at the beginning, again, the make function that we use to create a map like this. Note the comparison between the two make calls. So here, when we created a map, we have a type of the map and we wrap it into make function. And that creates an empty map. Here, we're not creating an empty map, we're creating an empty list of maps. That's why now we have the brackets before the map. And when I save this, 
we're going to have an error because this time, because it's a list, we need to actually define a size or initial size of this empty list. And because slices are dynamic, this is going to be the initial size and it will expand automatically as we add new values, which means the size, the initial size can be one or even zero because it will increase anyways when we add new elements. So with this syntax, we're initializing a list of maps. And finally, as the last step, going back to our book ticket logic, we of course want to add, instead of adding first name plus last name in our bookings list, we want to add user data map and save. There you go. So append stays the same because it's a slice again, but instead of a string, we're adding now a map to our list. So now we have a bookings list, which contains all the user information as key value pairs. We still have an error in our application, which is right here where we are going through the bookings list and grabbing the first names from each element, which is logical because in this code, we are treating the element of the bookings list as a string and not a map, which obviously has changed. So we have to change the logic here as well. So now each booking elements or the value of this booking variable is a map with the key value pairs for first name, last name, email, and number of tickets. So it's actually now easier to extract the first name from the map by simply using the key name, which we called first name. And that's it. So this will give us a value of the first name. We don't have to split a string or do anything here. And we can also use that directly right here and save. And that's it. So again, in our bookings list, we have maps for each user with different data, one of them being first name. So we can grab the first name value from each map using this syntax and then add it to the first name slice. So that fixes the issue. And finally, as a great feature of Go, we're reminded that we're no longer using this strings package. So we should get rid of it and no more errors in our application. So now we can run our application to make sure everything works perfectly. Plus to also check our changes that we store the complete user data in the bookings. Let's also print out the bookings list of maps after every booking. Let's see, list of bookings is And I forgot the new line. And there you go. So after the booking, we have a list of bookings, which is a slice, you see with the brackets. And inside that we have one map, because we just have one booking. And this map contains basically these key value pairs for email, first name, last name, and number of tickets divided, separated by columns. And let's try another one. And now our list of bookings has two maps like this. And the printing of first names also works fine. Now let's say we wanted to collect different types of data on users. For example, we asked for their date of birth, which is a date value type, or we asked a user to opt in for a newsletter. And we would save that information as a Boolean data type, like is opted in for newsletter. We may even want to save lists associated with users, like let's say a manager books tickets for her team and we would like to know names of these team members to know who will attend the conference. So for this user, we can save a list of team members they will bring with them. And this would be an array or slice of attendance names. If we wanted the team members email addresses, in addition, 
then this would even be a slice of maps where each map will hold the name of the attendant and their email address. So user entity would have all this data of different data types associated to it. We may also have other entities in our application like a conference, which will have its own data associated to it, like in which cities the conference is held, on which dates it is hosted, how many people are attending, etc. Again, values of mixed data types. And as we saw in the previous example, maps in Go limit values to only one data type. That's why we had to do this type conversion to save number of tickets for user as a string instead of uint. So how can we save mixed data type values for an entity like a user or a conference in our Go application? Well, for that, we can use what's called a struct in Go, which stands for structure. Structs or structures let us define key value pairs for an entity like user, but with mixed data types. So let's see how we can create a struct. So right here, outside all the functions on the package level, we're going to create a struct. First of all, we have a keyword struct and it's block with curly braces. And within the block, we define the list of keys like first name, last name, email, and number of tickets like this. Note that we're not using quotes here. And for each key in the struct, we also have to define the type of the value, right? So instead of having one type for all the values, we can choose different type for each value. So the first name will be a string, the last name will be a string, email will be a string, and number of tickets will be uint. Again, if we had other data types, like a Boolean for is user opted in for news, letter, we can basically add them, right? So we can have mixed data types for the values, but our struct is not done yet. First, we need a name for our struct, which in our case can be a user data, for example. And finally, at the beginning, we have to create the struct using type keyword like this. This actually means that we're creating a custom type in our application, which is called a user data. Another very important advantage of structures over maps is that in addition to just being able to specify these mixed data types, the structure gives us this custom type like user, where we can define exactly what user type should look like. So what properties it should have. And with map, we just have an empty list where we can just put whatever we want. So structure allows you to create a predefined structure by listing all the properties that it should have. So here we are defining the structure of our user type and that a user has first name, last name, email, and number of tickets. And if you know object oriented languages like Java, struct can be compared to classes in those languages. So we're creating a custom data type called user data with these properties associated to it. Great. So now let's go ahead and use our user data structure instead of the map. So first of all, we're going to change our bookings from a list of maps to a list of user data structures. So we're going to grab the map type and we're going to replace it with user data struct type like this nicer syntax everything else stays the same so this line basically now creates or initiates an empty list of user data structs now of course we also have to create the user data struct instead of the map in the book ticket function so let's scroll down to here and the user data instead of creating a map here we're going to create a struct like this, the name of the struct and curly braces. And inside that, we're going to set the values for each property or each field name. So first name is going to be the name from the first name variable. In this case, they're called the same, but of course, it could be different values. Then we have the last name 
text field of our struct. And the value will be from the last name variable, email, same here. And the key name for user tickets like this and the value called user tickets. And when setting these values, we have to separate each line using a comma. So at the end of each line. So this will give us a user data object with all the user data. So we don't actually need any conversion from u in type to string, as well as we don't need these lines here. So let's get rid of it. And again, our code looks a little bit more cleaner. And a reminder from Go that we don't need the string conversion package anymore. So let's remove that as well. And finally, as the last fix, because we still have one issue, which is right here, getting the first names, because now we're accessing the first name with a syntax for map, but a booking variable is not a map anymore, it's a struct. And to get values from struct, basically we use a syntax with dot. And as I mentioned, a big difference of structures over maps is that it gives you a predefined structure. So now when I type dot after a struct element, Go actually gives me suggestions, property names that the struct has. And I can just choose one like this, but also, if I actually misspell a name of the property of a struct, Go can help me identify this error even before running the application. And this is because we have created a real type with a structure in which the Go compiler knows the associated properties. So as you see, when working with structs, the syntax is simpler than with maps. So our code looks cleaner and less messy. Awesome. So that's basically the final result of our code. We're also using just one package here so we can remove the parentheses here. And again, we can test our application. And in the output, you see the line where we're printing the list of bookings, which is now a list of structs. This is how it looks like. So we have a slice with square brackets. And inside that we have one element, which is a struct with a nice short output. And again, if we add another user booking like this, you see one struct and another one. Now let's say after user books a ticket, we want to generate that book ticket and send it to the user per email address that they entered. So let's create a function called send ticket that generates a ticket and then sends it per email. And we're just going to simulate this logic with a simple code. And to simulate generating a ticket, we're just going to put together a string that basically says this is a ticket for a certain user. So let's use a print F. So we're just printing it out. And let's say this many tickets for first name, last name of the user. And let's add them here. If I save this, of course, we need to pass those variables as input parameters, right? So we can use them in a function. So I'm going to define them all here. I'm actually just going to copy this and then just add types. So we have uint string and another string like this. Now let's say instead of just printing out this string, we wanted to save it into a variable called ticket that we would then send per email. And that may be another useful example that you may need in your applications to basically save formatted strings in a variable instead of just printing them out. Now, if I do variable ticket here and save it, you see that 
I get an error because this doesn't give me the formatted string back, it just prints it out to the console and it doesn't return string. For that, we actually have a different function from the format package, which is called sprintf. And if I save this, you see that now we just get an error because ticket is declared but not used. So this function basically helps you put together a string, just like in the formatted output here, but instead of printing it out, you can save it into a string variable. So we have simulated the ticket generation, and now let's simulate sending it per email. In this case, we're just gonna use a print statement, which says sending ticket and this is the ticket to email address and that's an email address so we have the ticket so here we substitute the ticket itself so this string that we put here together and the email address and now we have to add email address also as input parameter so we can use it here. And let's do a little bit more formatting so we can see the ticket part really well. So I'm just gonna do colon here and let's print the ticket on a new line like this. And let's put new line here as well. And I'm also gonna add some visual divider for the ticket sending logic before sending the ticket and afterwards. And that's just gonna be simple visual divider, something that we're just gonna notice immediately. Like this, print ln, there you go. So this basically just simulates with simple code, a logic for generating a ticket and then sending it to email after user booked the ticket. So I'm gonna take the name of the function and we actually have to call this, right? So in the main function, right after book ticket gets executed, we're gonna call send ticket. And this expects the variables, which are actually the same as here, right? So we have user tickets, first name, last name, email, just like we defined it here. Awesome. So our application is ready. Let's now actually run our application and see that this output gets printed out. And there you go. So we have 45 tickets remaining, which is in the book ticket function. And then send ticket gets executed. It starts right here. And we are saying sending ticket. This is the string we put together. How many tickets? The user bot and the username, last name, to email address they gave us. Awesome. Everything works fine. Now let's say that generating the ticket and then sending it per email actually takes some time. It's not a fast process that we simulated here. Some data needs to be processed in the background. So if we had a real code that really generates a PDF of a ticket and then sends it using an email client to an email address, it would actually take some time, right? It would not be this fast. So let's say it would take 10 seconds. And we're also gonna simulate this 10 second delay using a function called slip from a time package. And in a slip function, we're gonna say how long it needs to slip. So 10 seconds. Again, the second unit is in the time package and we of course have to import it. Time. And there you go. So now whenever this function gets called, we're simulating that something happens here for 10 seconds. So in this case, it's just slipping. And after 10 seconds, this code gets executed and we're gonna get the summary. So the slip basically just stops the execution of the thread for 10 seconds. That's what we're doing. So now with this change, Let's run the application now and see what happens or see how application can handle this kind of time delay. So I'm gonna clean this up. Let's run. 
input the data. And as you see, I didn't get an input, enter your last name. And if I type something here, the application basically is blocked. And now you see that after 10 seconds were over, this got printed out and now application became responsive again. And now it's asking me for input for another user, right? Well, let's do that again. And again, you see it's stopped here. And now whatever I input, I don't get a feedback from the application. I just have to wait until this here gets printed out or this gets completed. So the application is being blocked while this code gets executed. And once it's done, then we can continue to another booking. Now, if this was an application that should handle multiple bookings of multiple users, then this would not be an optimal performance, right? And that's why we need concurrency in applications. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the main advantage of Go programming language is the simplicity of coding concurrent applications. So we can make our application concurrent in a very easy way in Go compared to other languages. So what would concurrency mean in this case? Well, our application runs in a single thread, right? When Go starts executing this main function, everything that you see here will be executed from start to finish in a single thread, which means all code lines get executed one by one in this order in our single threaded application. And that means if one of the lines, like this one here, takes longer, the execution in this thread is blocked. So the next line gets executed only after this one is done doing its job. So this has to wait those 10 seconds until it gets executed. But to optimize this, instead of just waiting for a certain code line to finish, when we know that something takes longer, we want to start a separate thread for it and execute this logic in a separate thread. So break out of the main thread and do this in its own separate thread. So now instead of waiting for 10 seconds to run the next line, after the function, the application executes, it gets to this point, it spins off a new thread, pushes the code execution there, and it immediately continues to the next line. So there's no waiting or blocking here. Very simple concept, actually. And that would mean in our application that while the ticket is being generated and sent to the user who just booked the ticket, we can continue to the next booking for the next user without any interruption. When the second user is also done booking her ticket, then again, the iteration will come here. And again, it will spin off a new thread to generate the second user's ticket and send it per email and so on. So basically, if 20 users book the ticket at the same time, 20 new threads will be created. Each one will do its job. And once completed, the thread will be deleted. And this whole time, the main application flow will continue without any interruptions. All right, now that sounds all cool, but how do we create those threads and make the code in this function, so this send ticket function, run in that separate thread? How do we do that? Well, we just write go in front of it, and that's it. We just made our application concurrent with a simple go keyword. And this keyword basically abstracts away the whole thread creation and cleanup and all this for you. So you as a developer don't have to worry about this. So now let's actually go and test it. I'm going to save it, clean up and input our data. And now when I click enter, I should be immediately prompted for another user's booking. So enter, and there you go. It asks me again for enter your first name. So let's continue. And while I'm actually typing, we see that at some point, 
the ticket creation logic was completed and I see the output here. So even though it printed out the text in the middle of my user input, it doesn't actually interrupt the application flow. So here I have .com and then continue with user tickets. And again, I can go on to the next user booking. And again, at some point, the second ticket is done and it gets printed here. And the user would be able to basically continue their booking without problems. So as you see, everything works great and we have improved the performance of our application with a simple change in our code. And this means now, even if the ticket generation took five times longer or 10 times longer, the main application flow would be unaffected by that and the users will basically get their tickets per email a little later, which is also not an issue. And to demonstrate that, I'm gonna actually put that timer to 50 seconds instead of 10. And let's execute again. So basically I have simulated booking for three different users. The ticket for the first user is not done yet, but we can keep booking new tickets. And at some point after the 50 seconds are over, you see the output for the first user and the second user. And finally for the third user. So our application stays responsive no matter how long this code actually takes to execute. Now let's see one more thing about concurrency in our applications. Let's say we did not have a for loop here that keeps on asking for the new booking, which means once the booking is done, the main application would exit. There is no next iteration here. So I'm gonna remove this for loop. And save it. We don't need a break statement because there is no loop. So basically in our application only allows for one booking. So let's run our application and see what happens with the booking logic. So we entered our data. The summary got printed out, a thank you message, how many tickets are left and the first names, but there's no ticket generation output here. So all the code in here, send ticket, that prints out these three lines, we don't see them in the output because they never got executed. So the application exited before this function was done. And this means that the main thread does not wait for any additional threads to complete or even start. When the main thread is done, the application is done as well. So whatever is happening in the other threads are basically getting terminated and ignored. So how can we fix this? Because obviously we want to send the user their ticket, right? Well, for that, we need to tell the main thread that it needs to wait until this thread is done doing its job. And for that, first we need to create what's called a wait group. So outside the main function right here, we're gonna create a wait group with curly braces. And this comes from a sync package. And we can then save the result into a variable called wg or wait group. And of course we need to import the sync package. And there you go. And wait group has three functions, which we can call using this variable. So on wg, right before we spin off a new thread, we're gonna call the first function, which is called add. And this function adds a number of threads that the main thread should wait for and should be executed before creating a new thread. And in our case, we have one new thread that we're adding, so we're gonna put one here. So if you had another go do something else function here, then you would put two. 
Another function that we have, the second function of weight group is called weight, and it needs to be executed at the end of the main thread. So as a last line of the code, we're going to do wait. And this basically waits for all the threads that were added right here to be done doing its job before the application can exit. So this just waits until this one is done. And the third function is called done, which gets executed in the function that runs in a separate thread. So in send ticket, and at the end of the logic, when everything is done, we're going to call wait group done. So done function removes the thread that we added right here from the waiting list. It's basically saying to the wait group, I'm done executing. So the main thread doesn't have to wait for me anymore. So the add function is increasing the counter of threads that the application should wait for, and done is decreasing that counter. So when the counter is zero, which means the main thread has no threads to wait for, it can exit the application. So this doesn't have to wait anymore. So now with this code changes, let's run our application again, and we should see the ticket being printed out before the application exits. So the summary got already printed out. Now it's just waiting. As you see, it's not exiting. It is basically waiting for those 50 seconds to be over. And then we'll execute these lines of code. And you see the output of send ticket. So this time the application actually waited for the separate thread to be done executing its logic. And once this was printed out, as you see, the application exited. Now you may be thinking you can surely implement concurrency in other languages like Java, right? Which is true, but in other languages that support concurrency, we have two differences with Go. First of all, writing code for concurrency in those languages is way more complex and you have more overhead for the initial configuration. And second, creating threads is more expensive which means it takes longer to spin off a new thread, and it also needs more memory space allocated to it. Now, what is the reason for these differences, or what does Go actually do better or more efficiently? Well, in Go, when we create a thread, Go actually spins off what's called a green thread. Green thread in Go is an abstraction of an actual thread, which is an operating system thread, and it's called a Go routine. So with Go keyword, we're actually creating Go routines. So in Go, we are only interacting with these high-level Go routines instead of the low-level operating system threads. And an advantage of working with this thread abstraction is that, first of all, it's cheaper to create, it's more lightweight, and takes little memory space. So each time you create a thread, you actually have way less overhead. And that means you can easily create and use thousands or tens of thousands of threads pretty fast, which in other languages is normally not possible without affecting the application performance. So in comparison, other programming languages, like Java that I mentioned, use operating system threads, which again need more memory space, more time to create. And that's why in these languages, sometimes we have concepts like thread pooling to optimize working with threads. And one last difference is that in other programming languages, threads do not have an easy communication medium or a way to talk to each other. In contrast, Go Routines has a concept of channels, which is a built-in functionality which allows easy and safe communication between the Go Routines. And this is a functionality that helps you handle concurrency issues, which are issues that may occur when threads have shared data or are dependent on each other. Now, we're not covering this in this beginner tutorial because it's a more advanced topic, but it's an important one. So I will include it in my upcoming Go course. Congratulations, you made it till the end. So what do you think about Go? Have you already used it in one of your projects? Share your thoughts in the comment section of the video. Now, in this beginner course, we built a simple CLI application 
without persistence, but learned a lot of the main Go concepts. But of course, in real life, this would be a web application with a UI and a database connected to it, where multiple users can book their tickets at the same time and the bookings will be persisted in a database. So if you want to take your Go skills to another level and want to learn more advanced concepts in Go, I'm actually going to create a Go course where you will learn to build exactly this kind of application with Go. If you want to be notified when the course is out, then check out the video description for a sign-up link. Or if you're watching this video by the time the course is already released, then you will find a link to the course itself. And with that, thank you for watching and see you in the next video.